Hi everyone, welcome back to The Physical Educator. Today we're going to talk about the CV system, part two. We're going to start with the objectives for 2.2.9 to 2.2.16. As you can see, there's only one objective one and one objective two. I mean, for every other specification point, you need a discussion, an explanation or an analysis. A lot more information required, more than likely going to be three, four, five mark questions, so you need to have enough points, enough evidence to hit them high marks. So we're going to start by looking at blood pressure, systolic and diastolic blood pressure and what it means. Blood pressure is referred to as the amount of force exerted against arterial walls. And we need to know the two different types of reading, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Both are measured in millimetres of mercury. Something for you to remember here, the word systole means contract and spill, and diastole means relax and fill. Say that to yourself until it sinks in. What that means is systolic blood pressure is the force exerted against the wall of the artery when the ventricle contracts, whereas the diastolic pressure is when the ventricle relaxes. That's why you get these two readings. And a good reading is about 120 over 80 millimetres of mercury, Anything above 140 over 90 is classified as high and anything below 90 over 60 mmHg is referred to as a low blood pressure. The next two points we need to look at blood pressure during rest and exercise and then different types of exercise be it dynamic and static. As we exercise, we experience changes to our blood pressure. Now just exercise, if that's what the exam question asks, we tend to think of dynamic exercise. So your systolic blood pressure will increase and your diastolic blood pressure will actually stay the same or slightly decrease. So we're gonna look at why that happens. When we're looking at exercise, we're looking at two different forms, dynamic and static. Now dynamic exercise is most exercise that you do where a muscle contracts, the other one opposite relaxes, etc. So a run, it could be a press up, they're dynamic exercise examples and it's an isotonic muscle contraction. Static exercise, pretend you're holding a weight out to the side in a T-shape, working on your shoulders, it's isometric contraction, a plank is an isometric contraction. They're examples of static exercise. Both of these examples, your systolic blood pressure increases, but it's the diastolic that's different. Dynamic, it goes down or just stays the same. Static, it increases. And why this happens is for a specific reason. Static and dynamic exercise both increase cardiac output. As we know, because we're exercising. Dynamic exercise recruits a greater number of muscle groups than static exercise. Therefore, more muscles will experience dilation in the blood vessels during dynamic exercise. Therefore, there's more blood, more dilation. Therefore, when we're relaxing, there's a reduction in diastolic blood pressure. Less muscle groups are recruited during static exercise. However, there is still that increase in cardiac output. Therefore, with this increased blood flow that is coming through these muscles, with a decreased dilation of blood vessels means that there's more pressure on the muscles, more pressure on the vessels within the muscles, therefore creating a increase in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Next we need to compare blood distribution at rest and during exercise. Distribution of blood flow during exercise can be categorized into two different things. We're going to look at percentages and actual figures. So if you look at, at rest during the distribution of blood, it's quite a bit of a, a mix really. 20% to the muscles, 15% to the brain, 25% to digestive organs, 20% to kidneys. The body is prioritizing a range of different organs. During exercise, this changes. 80 to 85% of the blood flow goes to the muscles. Therefore, a reduction in digestive organs, kidneys, brain, bones, Skin depends on what type of exercise is taking place. Maybe it increases or decreases from that 3% there. But the percentages go down. But when you look at the actual figures, it's different. Now you might ask the question, why does this happen? Why does it send less blood? It actually sends more blood in some cases. I'll explain that now. As you can see, at rest, 1,000 milliliters goes to the muscles, 250 mil to the heart, skin, bones, 750 mil to the brain and a, a litre to the digestive organs and kidneys. Now, what happens during exercise? 
is these numbers do change. Now remember the percentages we spoke of before. There's only five liters of blood in the body at rest. When we're exercising, there's up to 25 liters per minute going around the body. And look at some of these numbers. They actually don't change. Some of them stay the same, even though on the percentage, it looks like they're going down. The skin and the brain actually increases. So more blood does go to the brain and skin during exercise than at rest because of the numbers. So there's a big difference between the percentage and the actual blood distribution. But what you've got to take from this, and the most important thing is that the vast majority of the blood ends up in the muscles. When we exercise, there's a lot of cardiovascular adaptations that take place. We need to explore several ones further in this next topic. So first and foremost, we start with cardiac hypertrophy, the one everyone's familiar with, a bigger, stronger heart. Now there's a knock-on effect because of this, and that's why you start with cardiac hypertrophy. The knock-on effect is that you have an increased left ventricular contraction force, meaning your left ventricle can contract faster and stronger. Therefore, there's an increased stroke volume. Because of the increased stroke volume, it means we can have a decreased resting heart rate and a decreased working heart rate, which still maintains cardiac output. Separate to cardiac hypertrophy, we also have an increased capillarization around the lungs and the working muscles, therefore more gas exchange can take place, delivering more oxygen. And our final point is an increased arterial venous oxygen difference. Now what this means is, that there is a, a large number of oxygen approaching the muscle at the artery end, but then most of that oxygen diffuses because there's a bigger capillary network. So when it gets to the venous end, at the aftermath of the muscle, there is less oxygen at the venous end. And what this means is more of the oxygen has offloaded, more of the oxygen has diffused into the muscle. And that's what's important to note here with the arterial venous difference. It isn't a difficult concept to understand. Oxygen arrives at a muscle in an artery, it offloads into the muscle, and then it leaves in the vein. And it's the difference in oxygen at the artery when it arrives at the muscle, and at the vein as it just about leaves the muscle. And the bigger the difference in oxygen between these two points, the bigger the offload of oxygen which means it's diffused more into the muscles, therefore there's more oxygen in the muscles, you can train at a higher intensity for longer and faster. And finally, we're gonna look at VO2 max. The definition of VO2 max with an explanation, the difference in VO2 max between different groups, and then the difference in VO2 max between different modes of exercise. Firstly, we need to look at VO2 max and what it is as a concept. VO2 max, look at how it's spelled. V for volume, O2 for oxygen, and max for maximum. So it's the maximum volume of oxygen that can be consumed at one time. And what it is, is basically a relationship between your heart, lungs, and muscles to deliver oxygen to your working muscle cells. It's a term that is usually used within elite sports. And it basically means a higher VO2 max, the fitter you are, and you can perform at a higher intensity for longer. It's a concept that's measured in milliliters per kilogram per minute. You only have to remember that. You don't have to understand it in much detail. But it's interesting when you study milliliters per kilogram per minute of VO2 max in elite sport and how high some athletes can take their VO2 max. If you've ever watched the film, uh, the program about Lance Armstrong's career, Dr. Ferrari talks about, if you have a higher VO2 max than the next opponent, you will win. You are fitter than them. Now, obviously there's tactics involved in elite cycling, but VO2 max is a massive deciding factor in your success. Let's take cycling as an example. Look at these three cyclists. Each of them have a VO2 max, different values. And 81 milliliters per kilogram per minute will result in that cyclist being fitter than the other athletes. And there's other sports, distance event sports, where VO2 max is a massive player. Cross country skiing is another one. Now, cross country skiing, to do with the fact that you're, you're practically at altitude, you're training high up in the slopes and performing high up in the slopes, 
means that it's harder for you to train up there, therefore your adaptations are stronger. And some cross-country skiers can reach values as high as 90. Massive scores for a VO2 max. Other distance athletes as well, and you can research yourself to see which ones you, what you're interested in and which ones you can find. But ultimately, when you're in a distance event, the higher your VO2 max, the fitter you will be, therefore you stand a greater chance of winning. Remember, if you have a big VO2 max, it doesn't mean that you're going to be good at every sport. It's to do with your fitness levels. It is not going to help you run over hurdles. It's a sprinting event, therefore power is needed. It's not going to help you with the long jump. It's not going to help you throw a javelin. It isn't going to help you in them activities. It's a distance event component that's vital for success. So when we look at different groups that can be affected by VO2 max, there's four different groups that we need to compare. The first one is a trained athlete against an untrained athlete. Now the trained athlete will obviously experience more adaptations to the CV system, respiratory system and muscles, therefore that relationship will be stronger and they will have a higher VO2 max than the untrained person. Secondly, males versus females. Again, this doesn't matter about if the female is a fitter athlete than the male. What we're taking here is 100 males, 100 females on average. What are the differences? And it's just based on size. Males are generally bigger, so therefore they have a bigger heart. They'll have a bigger respiratory system. They'll have bigger muscles with bigger capillary networks. Therefore, more gas will exchange. More can be taken in from the atmosphere and a stronger heart pump to send it around the body. Therefore, males tend to have a higher VO2 max because of this difference. Third comparison is young against old, and this with everything else that happens with age, your VO2 max decreases. Uh, I've experienced this myself in 10 years since le leaving university. My VO2 max took a hit when I did it as part of training for uh, my students IA last year at a sports lab. My VO2 max decreased by 10 milliliters per kilogram per minute, which fits in line with your maximum heart rate decreasing with each year of age. Therefore, my VO2 max saw a similar result. And lastly, we need to look at an athlete against a non-athlete. This is different from trained versus non-trained because we're talking about an athlete. We're talking about an elite performer. We're talking about someone who doesn't only train hard, but they're probably genetically predisposed better than other people. That's why they get to the level they get to. Usain Bolt has natural speed. Mo Farah has natural fitness. Now they've trained incredibly hard to get to the level they're at, but they were blessed with a natural ability that they have enhanced. And that's where an athlete comes in. Not only are they trained athletes, but they are elite athletes and they started off in a better position than most other people who class as non-athletes. So when you're doing an athlete versus a non-athlete, the non-athlete might be a very fit runner, might, put, might do the Ironman, might be a very, very fit athlete, but they're not an elite athlete. And that's what's the difference here between an athlete and a non-athlete. And the athlete has a genetic predisposition as well as training that surpasses the non-athlete for a VO2 max and enables them to reach a much higher VO2 max. The last point we need to look at are three different modes of exercise and how they can impact your VO2 max. And looking at these three modes of exercise, you can probably figure out quite quickly which one requires the most oxygen. We've got a performer on a treadmill using the big major muscles in the legs, the arms, the torso, the core. Very weight bearing exercise requires a great deal of oxygen. Secondly, we have a cycle ergometer using the big major muscles in the legs, but that is pretty much it really and in a seated position. So this will require less oxygen than somebody running on a treadmill. That does not mean that elite cyclists have a lower VO2 max than elite runners. This is a mode of exercise. It's very different to comparing elite performers. And finally, we have an arm ergometer, which is like an arm bike. But if you don't have an arm bike, if you did a very steady isokinetic bicep contraction with a light dumbbell and many, many reps, you would get the same thing here and that would be even less oxygen required because you're just working them muscles in the arm. So there's less muscles recruited, 
therefore there is less oxygen required, therefore it will strain less on your VO2 max. Good luck with your studies. If you're a teacher looking for resources on Unit 2, Cardio Respiratory System, you can visit the Physical Educator TES site and you can pick up Respiratory System and CV System resources in the shop there. Thank you for visiting the Physical Educator. See you next time.